if someone had point blank asked me, I probably would have told just because it wouldn't have occurred to me not to. And it didn't occur to me to tell because nobody asked. I think when you're going through such a terrible experience, you feel very, very alone. I'm an Olympian and yet I survived childhood sexual abuse. And there's, there's plenty of other people out there that have gone on and led happy, successful lives. So I think it's important for other victims and survivors to tell their stories. So I was abused from five to seven years old um, by a good friend of mine's father. So this was a friend of mine that I was going to their house on a regular basis for play dates. They were coming to my house on a regular basis. So this was a man that I trusted, that you know my parents trusted. He was always a part of the game. So if we were playing hide and go seek, he was like a big kid in the game itself. You know, he was hiding or seeking or a part of it. If we were playing tag, he was playing. If we were climbing trees, he was climbing trees with us. So, you know, all of my other friends' parents or my own parents, whereas they were always observing us and watching us, he was always a part of the game, which by far made him the coolest parent. And on top of that, he had money and he had a car. So that, you know, made him even cooler. So if we wanted to go get ice cream, we could always go get ice cream. Whereas, you know, my parents nine out of 10 said, no, you'll spoil your dinner. <laughs> you know, he was always game and he, would, he could drive us there and then he would pay for it. So, I mean, this, this man just had this perfect setup because he was just a grown up big kid. How the conversation came up, I have no idea, but somehow I ended up telling this friend of mine. And at that point, I'd never really put two and two together on, on kind of what it was that had happened to me. And she was the one that had that kind of looked at me and said, you know, Margaret, you know, I think you were molested. You know, you should tell your parents. And I was like, huh. You know, because everything that happened to me when I was younger, I mean, there, I was always uncomfortable. You know, there, like I said, there were several instances and I was never comfortable in the situation, but I never put two to two together and, and thought this man is hurting me. You know, this, this was someone I trusted. This was someone I cared about. You know, I, every time, you know, your parent sends you out the door is a young child you're basically told by your parents to trust these people that you're going to their house. I mean, you know, you're sent out the door with the basically <laughs> the underlining theme being, you know, trust and respect these parents, mind your manners and basically do what they say. Treat these parents like you would treat and respect, you know, your father and I is, is kind of the underlying message. So all of a sudden at 11 years old, my friend is, is putting a word on it, is putting a label on it. That was really the first time that my brain kind of caught up with all these emotions that had been happening and going, huh. I had had, you know, sexual abuse education in school, which I didn't realize was apparently very rare. I thought everybody grew up having that. And the same kind of thing. I remember watching videos in, you know, in school, learning about sexual abuse and getting uncomfortable. I never quite put the dots together. And I never, you know, during this learning process, I never had that wow moment and thought, hey, that's, that's what's happening to me. But the same thing would happen. I would get really, really uncomfortable during this learning process and just something didn't feel right. But I'm still really grateful for that education because without that education, I don't think my 11-year-old friend would have known what it was. I don't think she would have been, you know, when she heard my story, I don't think she would have had that eureka moment and go, hey, you were molested. I don't think she would have known what that word meant. So that education was still important because for another 11-year-old to sit there and hear my story and, and put two and two together, even if I couldn't quite, you know, make the dots connect, you know, for her to be able to make the dots connect and go, you need to tell an adult. You need to tell your parents. You know, that, that was a huge, a huge step for me. So I go home that day and you know, my, my mom's first clue that, that something was wrong should have been the fact that it was a beautiful day outside. And, and she's decided that she's going to put, she 
had this border that she was going to put up around the, the wall of her bedroom. And, you know, I volunteered to help. So her first clue, you know, her 11 year old daughter is volunteering to stay inside and help with the chore when it's, you know, beautiful outside. And I always wanted to play outside. So, you know, of course she's thrilled. Oh yeah. You want to help? Great. <laughs> and, you know, for the next several hours, you know, I, I helped my mother put this border up and, uh, I tell her my story. I have no idea how she did it, you know, but she listened and she just said all the, the appropriate kind of, okay. And what happened next? And not, you know, all the little bitty words, she didn't freak out, but all the little bitty words of just kind of what happened next and okay. And she just listened. I got it out in one take. I was very, very lucky that I, I just, there we go. Done. I, I don't, I don't know how long it took us to do this, this whole thing. Um, I have no idea where my dad and my sister were. They were, they were off doing something for the day, but they weren't at home. So I told my whole story. And then of course, you know, I go off and I go about my day. And of course I leave my mom, you know, devastated in her bedroom with this border that she now hates that's, you know, glued to the wall. It never occurred to me that they wouldn't be there for me and it, it never occurred to me that they wouldn't do the right thing and that they wouldn't go to the police or that they wouldn't do things legally and honestly at that point it, it never occurred to me that the legal system would sort of let me down which is what happened you know it, which, which which was very difficult because as an 11 year old things are very black and white there's the right and there's wrong and that was a that was a, a big eye-opener for me as an 11 year old that there's a lot of gray in the world. You know, again, I, I look back at my mother that she had to, to teach an 11 year old a lot of life lessons that you shouldn't have to learn. Like the world is not fair. You still always have to do what you can control and do what you can do. And, you know, they made it very clear from day one that, you know, they were going to pursue this thing legally as far as they could pursue it. And they did. And, you know, that's always meant a great deal to me. My parents never focused on revenge. It was never about, yes, it was about, you know, legally we're going to pursue this man and, and we're going to try to do that. But the flip side of that was when I was going to counseling and, and, and I was getting help, the mindset was, okay, this thing has happened. We're not going to focus on him. We're going to get help for you. And I'm, you know, and, and, and my mom looked at it was, all right, I have a, an 11 year old girl who is no longer acting like an 11 year old girl anymore or a normal 11 year old girl anyways, the way, however it is, 11 year old girls are supposed to act. And instead of focusing on this man and just being angry and, and wanting to take out all this revenge on him, I'm going to focus all my attention on trying to figure out how to make my 11 year old girl normal again. And so we never talked about him. Yes, the legal stuff was going on somewhere in the background, but we never talked about him ever again. And it was all the focus was on me and trying to get me back to normal. I think the, the worst thing that sexual abuse does to people is it takes away your sense of, of value and it takes away your sort of that, that self, sense of self. It's, it's self value. And I think the first step to sort of getting that back is, is when somebody else believes in you and believes what you have to say and believes your story. And that's kind of that first step to getting a little bit of that that sense of self-value back. You know, I, I had symptoms, but the symptoms that I had were not symptoms that our society would deem as unhealthy. I was an overachiever. You know, I felt like I had no value and I felt like I wasn't good enough. And so the way that I acted out, so to speak, or the way that I felt like I had to gain value was I had to overachieve in everything out the nines. You know, I had over a 4.0 GPA in high school. 
I think I graduated college with like a 3.4 GPA while swimming, you know, on a, on a college scholarship. You know, I ended up competing in the Olympics twice. And, you know, I had this, this plethora of all of these achievements kind of that I could pull out of this, this hat bag because I never felt like I had value. And so I had to do all of these things because I had this sort of this, this hollow pit on the inside that I could never seem to fill up because I never felt good enough. And so I have figured out that there are little things about my personality that to me are not odd, but that are definitely not things that normal people do. And, you know, it's, it's been interesting actually. I've, I've been taking ballroom dancing lessons and, uh, you know, you, you have to touch people when you're dancing with them. And when I first started taking, you know, ballroom dancing lessons, I, I had to get used to that because as a swimmer, it's a very solitary sport. You're not touching people. You're by yourself. And it's, it's, you know, and dancing is just not like that. And, you know, especially, you know, you're with different partners. So not only are you just getting used to one person, you're having to get used to different people. And so that's been a bit of a challenge for me, which I think has been a very good and very healthy challenge. And I've been learning various types of dances. So it, I've, I've been having to, to not just get used to, like I said, one person or one specific touch, but I've, I've been having to get used to people touching me in all types of places. And it, again, it, it, it's, it's all normal and it, it's all in a very platonic way, but it's, it, it was definitely very uncomfortable for me in the beginning. And, you know, I've, I've been doing it for almost a year now and there's definitely still times or certain moves when I, I find myself on the inside cringing and then of course I hope my face isn't you know reflecting it but I, you know I, I think I do a pretty good job in in most social settings of sort of quote-unquote acting the appropriate way but I would say I'm probably not a super touchy-feely person and yeah I, I would say that's probably been a, as a result from this. You know, I, I didn't get to the Olympics by myself. First and foremost, I had my parents. You know, I had my family. You know, I had coaches, I had trainers, I had team doctors, I had um, nutritionists, you know, I had massage therapist, I had uh, the, the weight staff, you know, and, and that's not even to talk about at the Olympics themselves. I mean, we had, what, 42 people on the team? we probably have 35 staff or 40 staff. There's so many people it takes to get someone to that level. If it took that many people to get me to the Olympics, why in the world would I think that I could get over sexual abuse by myself? If I needed that many people to become an Olympian, why would I, why would I want to get over sexual abuse by myself? You know, so I, I like to make that comparison of, of having a team. It took a team of people to get me to the Olympics, and it also took a team of people to help get over my sexual abuse. It took my parents, it took my family, it took my friends, and there, there were several friends. Not, you know, I didn't tell a ton of people, but my immediate circle knew. My immediate circle of friends always knew. And then I had the advocacy center, and I had that team of support, you know, professionally there. And so, like I said, why in the world would you want to do all of that by yourself? But it takes an entire team of people to be successful in life in any endeavor. And that's just one more endeavor. You can overcome it. And... It doesn't happen in a day. You know, I, I remember my mother telling me that at 11 years old, this was something that was current. And 
every single day I was going to be one day further removed from it and I was going to be a little bit further from this and it was going to get a little bit easier every single day that I was further from it and I think she was right and I don't know that I'll ever be 100% over it you know so to speak and I don't know that I ever want to be 100% over it because I think it's had a huge role in my life and developing who I am and I think it's given me a lot of strength I think it gave me a lot of strength as an athlete. I think as an athlete, I always had an inner strength because I felt like I'd survive something. I always felt like I could look around the other people that I was competing against. And especially at an early age, you know, I didn't think that they'd ever really been through anything yet. They might have, who knows if they had or not. But at least in my head, that's what I told myself was that, you know, Everybody around me, these people haven't, haven't been through anything yet. And I've survived something. And I learned to gain a sense of strength from that. And so in a lot of ways, as terrible as this, this horrible thing was, it defined who I was. And it gave me a sense of strength. And it gave me a sense of my character. I think one of the... The greatest things about that is it, it shows that you can come out on the other side. You can survive anything and you can be successful. Whether that success is being an Olympian or being a CEO or having a happy marriage or a happy relationship. So whatever that definition of success is, I think you can achieve it and you can reach it 